Hello, National Community Church. There you are. What a wonderful thing it is to see you here and in my mind see you folks online. The best is yet to come. I get to speak this weekend on this thought, leaning into tomorrow. That's what I've titled it, leaning into tomorrow. It was a beautiful spring day. It was Easter Sunday, 1799, in the little village of Felskirch in Austria. And the villagers awoke to find their village surrounded by Napoleon's army. They knew the town defenses couldn't stand any kind of assault, so they called a, a leadership gathering, if you will. And they gathered to consider the white flag of surrender. And in that somber assembly, the dean of the church stood and in a trembling voice said this. I love this. This is Easter day. This is the day of our king's resurrection. We must have one moment of triumph. Let us at least ring the bells. If the town falls, it falls. But we must ring the bells of Easter. And soon from the church towers, the bells pealed and their music echoed up the valleys and across the fields of, around that little village of Felker. And the invaders massed outside the city gates were confounded. They said, like, what's going on? Why such a celebration? And this was their conclusion. They concluded that the Austrian army had arrived during the night to relieve the town and the French broke camp and went into full retreat before the bells stopped ringing. Now, part of that's history, part may be legend, but the point is this, that there is a sense in which in the face of insidious things, in the, in the face of difficult times, for the bells to ring out, proclaiming the resurrection of the king is a powerful thing. The author who included this story in a little book he wrote some years ago says this, in a more profound way, the church, like that mountain hamlet, is under siege by a mighty adversary. That's nothing new. That's, not, that's old news, if you will. That's how this thing works. Powers and principalities, far-reaching influence, seek to destroy the city of God by every means and viewed from a purely human perspective, if you will. The cause of righteousness is, is really uh, up against it in many places. But God's people, he says, don't see the conflict from the vantage point of the world or measure resources by the wisdom or strength of man. I think I just heard that from here, both in song and in Pastor Mark's comments. Why? Because we... You out there in that large cyberspace family, we belong to another country, a city not made with hands. And when we see our present struggles, whatever they are, in the light of this higher reality, it's not strange that the sound of victory should rise above the strife. Whatever our experience in this present age, here it is, the kingdom of Christ shall never perish. And this wasn't written like last Tuesday. This was written in 1980. A lot of stuff has happened in the last 40 years, but it's still true. And the best is yet to come. So I'm reading this and I say, so where did this idea of another reality come from? Where, what do you mean, citizens of another country? What's with this resurrected king? Well, many of you know this. His grand entrance wasn't so grand, if you will. Here are a people in Israel who have been waiting for a thousand years for a king to come since King David, who was the big king, if you will. And many of you have heard this 150 times, 273 times while well, you're hearing it, 274, because the story is so great. And the Gospels chart this story. This is how it starts in Mark 1, 14 and 15. It says, after John, John the Baptist, was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. The time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Turn around. Here's the kingdom. And, and you know the drill, right? They're waiting for armies and pomp and circumstance. And here's the carpenter standing there. But what's the shape of the kingdom? What is that? Well, first of all, and essentially, if you hear nothing else this weekend, hear this about the kingdom of God. The kingdom is always about the king. 
It's always about the king. It's about obedience to the king's rule and his authority. It's all about proximity to the king. It's being connected and ultimately living in his house, living in his city. I've only been in the presence of real royalty one time. It was, um, it was June, June 13th to be precise. I went back, checked it out, 2002. Ruth and I were in the British Isles. We had taken a little trip and were driving down the north side of the Bristol Channel going toward over there toward the west part there. And we're driving down the Bristol Channel and, and we come to this town called Newport, Wales. And we drive into the town and there are barricades like everywhere. They're you know, just all over. And we said, we pulled over, and I said, I want to see what's going on. I said, what's going on? And they said, well, the queen is coming. Queen Elizabeth is coming here today. This is her jubilee year, 50 years on the throne of this, of this country, and, and she's coming to see us. And we said, well, we've never seen royalty. We need to be a part of this shindig. And so I don't know where even the word shindig comes from, but it sounds like an old Irish word or something. But anyway, we, we parked the car and got out. And when we got out, they put a union jack in our hand and they put the flag of Wales in the other and we joined the crowd and we're there. You know, we're ready for when, and they wait. We wait for 30 minutes and 40 minutes. And finally, a little band comes along and then a bulldog on a leaf sort of a symbol. And then the queen gets out of the back of her car it rolls or something, and it's a lime green outfit, and she's greeting the children, and they're giving her flowers, and we're cheering, and and we're from the colonies, right? We're cheering for the king, for the queen. <laughs> there's something, there's an aura about a monarch, and if you think there's aura about a monarch like that, how about the resurrected king of the universe for aura, if you will? Can you imagine? And so the kingdom in in these gospels gets revealed in a couple of different ways, lots of different ways, but let me just give you two. The actions of Jesus are windows on the kingdom. The actions of Jesus are windows, glimpses of the kingdom. Now, scholars call them signs and wonders. That's the literal translation of like miracles like we were talking about just a moment ago. I, I love the one in Mark 2 about these four friends bring a person who's paralyzed, this guy, and they climb up on the flat roof of the Palestinian home. I love this story. And they're tearing the roof off, right? And Jesus is inside. Nobody can get in. It's too crowded. And if I'm on the inside, all of a sudden, dirt clouds start falling down and shafts of light coming down through. And people are wondering what's going on. And then it goes dark because they're letting this guy down through. The, and he ends up there on the floor. And Jesus does two things. First of all, he forgives his sin, but really gets to the religious types. And then he says, well, I could do that. Or I could say, rise, take up your mat and go home. And you know, that's a moment. That's a glimpse of what the kingdom of God is about. That's what the king is. He's about surprises that are always good surprises from my experience. And then John 2, Pastor Joel last week talked about the wine at the wedding and saving the best to the last. And it's this miraculous thing that happens to bless the people. And then my favorite, I think, and there are lots of miracles, who can choose a favorite, but I, but I love John chapter nine, where the man's blind from birth and, and Pastor Mark has spoken of this eloquently, saying he didn't just heal his eyeballs, he rewired his brain, all of that. But you read John nine, and that whole, that's a whole meal in John nine about what it looks like to be touched by the kingdom of God the kind of interaction that takes place there. So, 73 years ago, I was a six-year-old kid. 6,000 feet up in the tea plantations of South India, and I had contracted what was called then malignant malaria, which is a virulent form back in the day, and you didn't have lots of medications at that time. And I had been delirious for several days. And two of those days, I had temperatures up to 106 degrees, my mother said. And that day, I had turned to her in, in my delirium and said, Mommy, I'm going home. And she didn't know if that meant America or meant heaven. She didn't know what that was. But they were praying. And intuitively, home should be peace and safety, shouldn't it? I mean, that's what you think of as home. And in the night, there was a knock on the door of our small quarters there in that space. And there stood an Anglican missionary lady. And she just said to my mother, I was praying and felt compelled to come and pray for Dickie. That's what they used to call me. 
And my mother said, absolutely. And this lady walked in, knelt down beside my bed, put her hand on me and prayed for me. And that night the fever broke. And it was a, and it was a, it's a glimpse of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God looks like that. The kingdom of God and the king sends out emissaries, if you will. And sometimes they look like Anglican, Anglican lady missionaries, just saying. Okay, so that's one way. The other way is the names of Jesus, the roles that he has when you read the scriptures. I mean, somebody here is saying, you know, I'm just all over the map. What I need is stability. He's the great I am. Somebody says, I just need, I just need care. He's the good shepherd. Somebody says, I need protection. He's the door. The shepherd used to lay down a, across the entrance to the sheepfold to protect the sheep. Somebody says, I just need intimacy. He's your friend. He, he elevates the idea of friendship to the highest level you could expect it to be when you read him. Somebody says, I'm hungry, he's living bread. I'm thirsty, he's living water. I want direction, he's the way, the truth, and the life. I need a family, he's the beloved son. I need identity, he's the son of man. I need access, he's the son of God. I, I just need to learn, he's the teacher. I need help, he's my savior. I need to be, I'm, I feel trapped, he's my redeemer. You say, I feel so alone. He's Emmanuel, God with us. And he's the anointed leader, Jesus, the Messiah. And in all of that unfolding of the kingdom, right in the middle of the text, I don't know if it's the exact middle, but I think it's, it's out there, okay? In John, the 11th chapter, Jesus has these three friends, two sisters, Mary and Martha, and their brother, Lazarus. And Lazarus gets sick and they send a message to Jesus saying, Lazarus is sick and he dies. Jesus doesn't, when you read the text, you can read it in John 11, he gets the message and he doesn't immediately go. See, now I, I have to confess, I don't quite get that because I'd go. I think, you know, I don't want, I want to be a caregiver. I want to respond. I want, but he didn't go because he, he, he's the king and he knows, right? And on his arrival, verse 17, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. And now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. It's a little town. And many Jews had come to Mary and Martha, Martha and Mary, to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord Martha said to Jesus, if you've been here, my brother would not have died. I don't know the tone. This is where I'd like a Bible with inflection. Just saying, okay? <laughs> But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Well, the, she came from a theological tradition that said there will be a resurrection in the last day. And she said, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said to her, and, and this blows it out of the water right here. This isn't just about a fact of the resurrection, a theology of the re resurrection. He says, I am, I am, there's that word, I am the resurrection and the life, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. A moment of triumph in the face of defeat. Of defeat. This is the day of our King's resurrection. Let the bells ring. That's how it is. And, you know, we have this thing about death, don't we? I chose to speak on this topic, the idea of what's next or leaning into tomorrow or heaven or whatever, wherever we're going with this. I chose to speak. You say, well, it's because you're older and you're closer to it than most of us are. <laughs> but but here's, here's the deal, you know. I just want to say this. If, if I believe him, the king, what we call death isn't the end. It's like a blip on the screen. It's just, it's, a, it's one of those moments that happens because there's a curse and there's sin and our bodies fall off. We call that death, right? Death is not the end. I'm a 23-year-old associate pastor with my father-in-law in Modesto, California, back in the 60s. And he's, um, he's, he's working. He was always a doer. He didn't just preach. He was, he's just a hands-on guy. And it wasn't a huge church. It was a few hundred. And he was out painting a, a, a concrete wall block wall in the breezeway of this church. And uh, he said, you know, Mrs. Martinez is in the hospital. Why don't you go see her? So I went to see Mrs. Martinez and uh, she was in desperate straits. I came back and I said, uh, Father Blake, his name was Roy Blakely, but we dubbed him Father Blake. I said, Father Blake, I'm just back from the hospital and uh, Mrs. Martinez is terminal. 
And he didn't even look at me. He just kept painting the wall. And he said, uh, aren't we all? I, I expected him to be upset, you know, or say, whoa, what do we do? Well, what you do is understand that the king, the resurrected king, lives in Mrs. Martinez by his Holy Spirit. And there's something about that that is not scared by death. Okay? I, I heard him speak at dozens of memorial services, my father-in-law, and he would always say this piece somewhere in the message. Here's what we know. Life is short. Death is certain. And the grave is not the goal. Life is short. Death is certain. But the grave is not the goal. Listen to how the Apostle Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, if you will. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Victory has reached out and gobbled that thing up, okay? That's Foth right there. That's not Paul. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Let me put it another way. It's not quite as dramatic, but it, for me, it helps me understand. In my limited self, in my life without Jesus, my experience is that I live, I live life with a small L, afraid of a big D at the end of what I consider life. When the resurrected king by his spirit comes into your life, and I submit to him, I get a whole new infrastructure and I start living life with a capital L and death becomes a small d at the end, okay? It's a speed bump, if you will. You know, I, at, at my age, people say, you know, people your age, they start slowing down. Well, you do, you know, you move slower, you got arthritis here and you can't, you, you know, that's it. But I would submit to you that when you have the life of Jesus in you, that as you get closer to the end of an earthly life, you start speeding up. Yeah, yeah. Just saying, all right? Life gets so complicated, you say. I mean, it, when we think about how we live our lives, we say, who do I please? My expectations of me? This, this is a key question. Am I trying to live up to my expectations of me or my parents' expectations of me or my boss's expectations of me or my tradition's expectations of me or my spouse's expectations of me or the system's expectations of me? I, the thing about resurrection life that I love is that there's only one set of expectations. There's only one person that I have to please. I get to please one person, the king. I live for the king. That's how it is. And you say, but I'm so connected to this world, to this body. And it's not bad. It's not bad to be connected to this body. It's the only one I have. So, you know, I want to be connected to it. This came home to me years ago. Um, I, again, I'm a church planter, 28 years old, near the University of Illinois. And Paul Todd became a friend. And Paul had been a tank commander under George Patton in the Second World War. And... Uh, he had fought for four years and finally been blown out of his tank in Germany, ended up for 13 months, I think, in the hospital. And uh, he, he would tell me just little snippets every once in a while about the horrors of the Battle of the Bulge and other kinds of things. And he had pulmonary problems, lung problems. He was in the hospital one time and his wife, Marge, been with him for a few days, wasn't life-threatening. She went home to get some rest that night and he had a, a moment that took his life in the middle of the night, unexpected. She came back and she felt all those things. She felt loss and grief and guilt and anger, you know, all those things that go through you when you say, boy, I wish I'd have, I needed to have been there and I wasn't there. And it came time for the visitation at the, at the funeral home and I'm there and again, I'm 28. And so I, I've got a lot to learn. You know, I'm in, in this whole arena of ministering to people. I'm pretty, I'm pretty green, but God has been gracious and, and I'm there with some other folks and Marge comes in and walks over to me and says, could I, is it okay if I touch Paul? And I, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, Paul's not there. That's just his house and he's, it's uninhabited now. You know, that's what I'm thinking in my head. But sometimes the Holy Spirit helps us shut up. Okay, I just put that, I, I think there's a verse here somewhere about that. But, I, but I, I just said, do what you need to do. And she walked over and stood by the casket and she just patted his hand. And she just talked to him. 
She wasn't, this wasn't necromancy. She wasn't talking to the dead. She couldn't believe he was dead. She was in shock. And she just said, she said, Paul, I'm so sorry I wasn't there. I, you just need to know that I love you. Wherever you are, I just love you, and so forth. And then she went and sat down. A little while later, I went over, and I, we were friends, and I sat by her. I said, Marge, could I ask you a question? Personally, she said, sure. I said, well, why did you need to touch Paul's body? And she said, um, here's the deal, Dick. He, she said, I don't know Paul the Spirit out there floating around somewhere now. I don't, I don't know how, what's happening, how that works. The only shape I know him in is this shape, this body. And I got to tell you, I can't help it. I've slept with that man for 25 years and I love that body too. So body inherently is not bad. It's what we have. It's what God gave us, knit together in our mother's womb as we earlier heard. But this, this whole idea of how do I, with this body, how do I learn to lean into tomorrow? What can I count on? What can I count on down the road? What can I count on after little d? What's, what's there? Listen to how Paul says it to Timothy. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. These are the metaphors. It's been a battle. It's been a race. I've hung on. I've kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Then James chimes in, if you will, and says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I like Paul's comments again in 1 Corinthians 13. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. It's just not a crown of righteousness. It's with the King Most High, face to face, vulnerable, intimate, if you will. And, and we, all, we all have these questions. What's it like over, the, you know, I, I think about family members, believers and friends who have gone on, as we say, crossed over on the other side of Jordan. You know, we have all kinds of euphemistic language for this. And uh, I think it's normal. To have, what's it like? <laughs> what's out there, you know? Joel, Pastor Joel, when he was younger, some of you know that he was an aide to me for one year back in the 1990s. And we had a friend by the name of Charlie White who was chief of staff for a congressman here. And Charlie contracted cancer that was virulent. And he came to faith in a six-month period. For, for him, life wasn't a marathon. Life was a sprint to the finish line. And he was in hospice and I called the congressman and said, I think we need to see Charlie because I don't think he has much longer. We walked into his house out in Vienna, Virginia, and uh, Charlie was there and he was skeletal. This body was going away, but his spirit was like in full form. I mean, he, it was vibrant. And we walked in and Charlie grinned at us and he said, Dick, what does it mean to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord? And you know, sometimes questions catch you off guard because you hadn't like thought of that yesterday. And I just, I just said, Charlie, I, um, I don't know. I haven't done that part yet. So I don't know what that is. But I think it means to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I think that's what it, you come to me for counseling. It's deep, right? And this idea of being with the king, this idea of, of connection, this idea of uh, uh, being right there next to him and with him is so strong in the scriptures. And so here's Jesus on the cross, his, his last hours before he dies on the planet. And he says to the thief who responds to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Or he told his disciples the night before, in essence, in my father's house in many rooms, you know, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going to go and add on a room and come back and get you. It's this very tactile thing that they would identify with where the, where the man of the household, the young man, would go and find a bride and bring her back and they'd add on a room to the house. So we all have our ideas about what that might be. Those are some images. But, you know, we say free of sin, there's no pain, no tears, light, warmth, music, color, that great cloud of witnesses, all of those things cheering us on. I love what E. Stanley Jones says about this. He was a famous uh, Methodist missionary in India. 
and evangelism, the good newsing, if you will, telling people about Jesus, bringing, pointing them to him was his heart. And on the back of a book that he wrote that was actually dictated after he'd had a stroke, it was his last one, it's called The Divine Yes. This is on the dust cover. I've often said half jokingly that when I get to heaven, I'll ask for 24 hours to see my friends. And then I shall go up to him and say, haven't you a world somewhere which has fallen people who need an evangelist like me? Please send me there for I know no heaven beyond preaching the gospel to people. That is heaven to me. It has been, is, and ever shall be. So our ideas of heaven are, at, whatever they are, they're good, okay? Whatever that means, wherever that is, however that works, they're good. I love what my young friend Matt Hall said. Matt Hall was the son of a congressman and his wife, Tony and Janet Hall. Some of you know the names and know them. And when he was 15 years old, he had a resurgence of leukemia and he, and he went home to the Lord just before his 16th birthday. But some weeks before that, his mom had been with him and she said to him, what do you think about heaven, Matt? And he said, mom, I'm not, I'm not afraid of going to heaven, but isn't it, uh, isn't it like mostly old people there? <laughs> I, I, I love that. I'm telling you in heaven, it's all young people. In heaven, it's all those people who are the resurrection life because that resurrection life gives us a new immortal physical body. One key about leaning in tomorrow is to understand that the king is not just rescuing me from my sins and recreating me into a different person. He's building a whole new thing. When you read the last part of the last book in this Bible, the book of Revelation, and it talks about that heavenly city, this is about a new world order. This is not a place of clouds and harps and little angels floating around. This is about a work environment, if you will, that the work, the drumbeat goes on. I love what N.T. Wright in his work, Surprised by Hope, says when he contends that every single thing done in the spirit of Jesus builds toward a new heaven and a new earth. This is how he says it. That's the logic of the mission of God, God's recreation of his wonderful world which began with the resurrection of Jesus and continues mysteriously as God's people live in the risen Christ and in the power of his spirit means that what we do in Christ and by his spirit in the present is not wasted. It will last all the way into God's new world. In fact, it'll be enhanced there. And you hear Paul echoing that in 1 Corinthians 15 again, verse 58, when he says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you, Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. A new heaven, a new earth, not just pie in the sky by and by. A new heaven, a new reality. I don't know, I don't know how it's all going to work, but I know where heaven is. I know where the, the heavenly city is. It's in the king's presence. Heaven is the king's presence. When the king's presence is here, when you worship tonight, that's what heaven's about. When, you, when a song rings out, I believe heaven is this place of sound and music and color and light. And, and it isn't. If, hear me on this, please. I don't think we have this life and then we have an afterlife. I don't believe that for a nanosecond. I believe we have one life and it's experienced in increments and it's ever more real when we're in Jesus Christ. It grows and grows and when this body withers and falls off at one point, you know, I understand we get a new body, I'm, check, I, I, I'm going there, I want one of those. And then we just, we just keep going. Life's journey is going somewhere. I would submit to you it's heading us toward home. When our moment comes and this body falls off, when that moment comes, a new heaven and a new earth, and the king of creation, if you will, is in the house. We are home. I loved Billy Graham's, one of his last books that he wrote before he passed away, or dictated as it were. It's called Nearing Home. When I think of what I'm leaning into as I age, as I keep on this journey with Jesus, I'm leaning into the home for which I am designed. And that's the one where the king is. That's the one where he is ever present and ever powerful. I have a friend, 
She has a powerful, powerful, sensitive voice, and when I think of leaning in tomorrow, I'm touched by her song. Her name is Sarah Groves. And I, I asked the guys here if I could do this. I, I don't think I've ever done this, but I'd like to close with a song, not me, with her singing. And I'd like us to take just a few moments and think about, reflect on this journey with the king and toward the king's house. And just let the words of her song wash over us and let his spirit do something in us as we listen to this. Breathe in of the spirit, reflect on the resurrection life that the king has placed in you. Just as a point of reference, Sarah Groves is not an old woman, okay? She's not old like me. She wrote this song in her late 20s and it's about her yearning in going home. Listen, reflect, the words will be on the screen and just let the Lord minister to you. I've been feeling kind of restless I've been feeling out of place I can hear a distant singing A song that I can't write but it echoes in what I'm always trying to say There's a feeling I can't capture It's always just a prayer away and I want to know the ending Things hoped for but not seen it be 
Father God, we come to you this weekend. King of the universe, king of all creation, resurrection and the life. We thank you for the grace that has overwhelmed us. We thank you for the moments, the windows on your world. We thank you for your names that give us hope. We thank you that in this great trajectory that we call life, that when we, when we claim you as you have claimed us, in response to your claim on us, we respond. When we do that, we start facing toward home. We start facing toward your presence in an intense dimension that we don't understand. Lord, in this moment with those in the sound of my voice, in this space around the world. There may be some who say, I have never, ever thought that I could have life everlasting in Jesus that was like resurrection, everything new. And I need my faults, my sins, my terrible choices, poor choices washed away and I need life anew and afresh. And in this moment, I take that step to say, I want to be yours. I want to head for home, full throttle, no holds barred, just because I believe by your spirit that what you have said in scripture is true. Thank you, Lord, for this company, this band of wonderful believers in you. And even as we lift our hearts in praise in this moment, may your spirit be ever so real. And thank you for speaking to us tonight, ministering your life in word, in song, and just by your presence with our brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said,